The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCET webcast, Leading Large-Scale OER Initiatives, Stories from the Top. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we go through the webcast, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. The webcast is being recorded, and we will share a link to the archive, PowerPoint, and any resources that are shared. If you'd like to follow along, we don't have a lot of slides today, but you can access the slides in the handout box. You can follow along on the Twitter chat. We anticipate that we'll have quite a bit of active Twitter conversation, and the hashtag is WCET Webcast. Today, we'll start with brief introductions. We'll move into a moderated discussion with our expert panelists. We'll get to audience Q&A, and then we will conclude. Again, as you have questions, enter them into the question box, and we'll hold those until the end of the presentation and conversation portion. But if we see a question that seems to be coming up a lot, then we will interject and get to your questions. We have a wonderful moderator today, my colleague Tanya Spillavoy, who's the Director of Open Policy here at WCET, and she has quite a bit of experience leading large-scale OER initiatives. So we're pleased to have Tanya. So I'd like to go ahead and have Tanya introduce herself, share an interesting tidbit, including her favorite animal, and then she will introduce the panelists. Go ahead and take it away, Tanya. You may be on mute, Tanya. Hi, everyone. It's so great to have you all on our WC webcast. Tanya, you your hear? audio is cutting out. You may want to close any other windows that are open. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, Tanya, your audio is isn't working. Okay. Why don't you go yeah, ahead and this call? This is Tanya. Can you? Yeah, your audio is is just not what it was 15 minutes ago. Please make sure that all of your windows are closed and possibly start uh, stop and then call back in. And I'll go ahead and move to our presenters today while you do that. So I'd like to ask Mark, Tina, and Kara to do brief self introductions. We'll start with you, Mark. Oh, hey, uh, Megan, you're kind of breaking up there, too. Um, I th think you asked me to go first. My name is Mark McBride. I'm the library senior strategist on the Office of Library and Information Services at, at SUNY System. Uh, you know, part of my uh, portfolio is I oversee uh, the open educational uh, resources initiatives across SUNY. Um, I know Tanya's just signing back in right now, uh, but Kara and I also have an assignment. Um, we're supposed to uh, share what our favorite animal is and maybe a small tidbit about ourselves. Uh, I, 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 my favorite animal is a, is a big, uh, dumb um, Anatolian shepherd who lives with me named Jethro, and um, he's a great dog. Um, and then a little interesting tidbit is I went to college uh, for about two weeks and then decided to hitchhike across the country uh, with a friend of mine and then came back 10 years later to college. That's great. My mom had a dog named Jethro growing up as well. Hey, <laughs> Tina, you're up. Thanks, Mark. This is um, uh, Tina. Introduce yourself. Fantastic. Good morning. This is Tina Parscall. I'm executive director for Colorado Community Colleges Online part of the Colorado Community College system. Um, my favorite app is my um, panda, who, yes, like a panda, but he Italian shepherd mix. And uh, unlike Mark, big fella, my, my dog is brilliant. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> sweet and unruly and a handful, but is the light of my life. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, everybody. This is Kara. Um, I'm so, Kara, do you want to go University next? Of I we City still College. be having some chat. And uh, I, of course, I, can you hear me talking? Yes, go ahead, Kara. Everybody hear me? Believe so. You are cut out as well. Okay, I'm on a landline. I'm on phone, so I'm going to just go ahead and talk. Uh, so, Kara is provost and dean of the school, the University of Mary College. Uh, interesting fact about me: that uh, when I'm not university administrator, I hang out in cemeteries. I'm actually, on the board of Association for Great. Great, okay. Well, we're gonna move ahead to the next slide here and we'll start our moderated conversation. Go ahead, Tanya. <laughs> Do we have audio? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the audio keeps. Uh, but we hear kind of... you. We don't hear Tanya. Okay. Okay. And I, I'm seeing all the notes. I'm not sure what the audio issue is today, but hopefully we can get some troubleshooting. And so please persevere. We are uh, doing our you best. Can maybe this is Kara. You go ahead and. Uh, Mark, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Yeah. I. Um... So, you know, I work for the State University of New York, the SUNY system. Um, we, uh, we have 64 campuses. Um, you know, our OER uh, initiatives probably began uh, in around 2011. Uh, one of our colleges, Tompkins Cortland Community College, we often refer to as ground zero for OER. Um, they were part of a Kaleidoscope grant um, and when they were um, they were working on um, you know adopting OER for college algebra and for a psychology course, um, they started seeing that not only were they saving students money, but there were also some other benefits. Uh, so system, um, and so you know uh, uh, around the same time, running in parallel. Uh, was a grant program that had just kick-started called the Innovative Instruction Technology Grant. Um, that grant program was used to, uh, to seed fund innovative ideas that faculty and staff had within SUNY uh, and just give them a little seed funding to see if they could take their idea, um, bring it to fruition, and then if there was an opportunity to bring something to scale. And this all started around 2011-2012. Pretty early in our IITG efforts and kind of following off the success at Tompkins Cortland Community College, we saw that OER was an opportunity for our system. Uh, we felt we could really take OER to scale, um, but we really didn't have a vehicle to do that. Um, an application came in for an IITG to test a model called Library as Publisher, and anybody in the library community might be familiar with this. This came out of SUNY Geneseo. Uh, and the idea that came from SUNY Geneseo was that they would put a call out for SUNY faculty to author open textbooks. Um, they ended up getting a lot more responses than they, they first uh, anticipated in receiving. So we saw a big, in, uh, a big need within our faculty to start working with OER, either as creators or, or as traditional adopters of OER. Um, as, as time progressed, we started seeing more OER activity and we decided to take the Open SUNY textbook project and morph it into a, a, a service called the SUNY OER services, with a, which is a shared service out of SUNY Geneseo. It was kind of like our way to scale OER across the system. And as we started putting that program into place, New York State received about $8 million in, uh, from, New York, from New York State uh, Ledge uh, to kind of increase OER adoption 
option at both SUNY and CUNY. So four million it came to SUNY, four million went to CUNY, um, and um, and of course I think most people know that you know with that in, infusion of state dollars, uh, SUNY has really started to scale OER. Um, you know, probably much quicker than we had first um, uh, pretty ho pretty much hoped to scale OER. Um, as of today, we have about 70,000 students enrolled in OER courses, um, and we're saving students about $8 million this year. Um, but, you know, we, we still have a lot to learn. Um, and the one thing we've learned is that you, you, you really do have to, you know, grow capacity in areas to support faculty. Uh, and there still is big need to get people to, to understand what OER is and uh, what OER is not. And I'll stop there. Great. Okay. This Great. Is Thank Megan. you, Mark. And um, Tanya, Tina, can, can you share about your? Yep. Uh, hi, this is, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, so uh, I'm the Parscale Executive Director of Colorado Community College Online. CCC Online is the consortium of the 13 colleges in the Colorado Community Colleges. We offer online courses on behalf of the colleges in the CCC system. Um, to give you some how we scale OER at CCC online, and it, it's funny because you know going after SUNY, we're we're just a micro dot <laughs> compared to what it is doing. Uh, we can dream big. Um, in this uh, this last spring semester, we had 43 OER courses. But to put that in perspective, that's 26% of the courses that we offer are OER. But because of our size and structure, those, um, those courses translate into um, 365 course sections because we do a centralized uh, course model, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Each semester, we roll out more and more OER courses. This fall, we'll have a total of 64 courses um, that utilize OER materials, which have either no textbook cost or no digital integration fee. We're also working towards an ambitious goal of a Z degree. Um, for those of you new to the OER space, a Z degree is a degree path in which students can earn a degree without any textbook costs. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we got here. Um, and there are a number of factors in Colorado that really enabled us to be able to do this at scale um, and to help CCC Online inter innovate in the OER space. First, by statute, all of the colleges in the Colorado Community College system are on a common learning management system. In our case, that's D2L or desire to learn. Colorado also uses a common course numbering system across all of the community colleges. This means that each course system-wide has the same course number, course description, learning outcomes, and topical outline. This means that the curriculum that CCC Online as a consortium offers is able to be applicable and meet the same learning outcomes um, for any of the 13 colleges in the system. And the curriculum is established by the faculty at the colleges and it has a, a great deal of consistency across all the colleges in the system. CCC Online also has a centralized course development process um, in that a course isn't developed by an individual faculty member. Instead, we have a faculty credentialed SME with the support of an instructional designer, librarian, and other course design resources. We also utilize a course master template, which helps. And all of our course developers participate in the subject matter expert orientation, which includes um, training in OER in our internal processes. Ironically, we also started um, looking at OER in 2011, like SUNY did. Um, we, at that point, just had two courses that we called textbook fee free courses, and it was a literature course and an English course. But we started to seriously start thinking about OER in about 2015. So in fall of, of 2015, we had 10 courses, um, and we've escalated since then. Um, strategically, it's very much part of our strategic plan. Um, in April, we convened our first OER task force group. Um, this has members of folks from all, um, 
operational groups within CCC Online. We developed our operational definition of OER, and we talk about things such as our course maintenance, accessibility, course design, how will we market. In terms of cost savings, we just, in, in the ac last academic year, was the first year that we really came up with the methodology to track the, um, the cost savings to students. So in academic year 18, we had 14,740 students enroll in a course that uses OER material. That's 29% of our enrollment. In the same academic year, we students saved over $777,000. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to Tanya. That is awesome. Both you and Mark have done such great work, and I'm so excited to hear what Kara has to say about UMUC. Great. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think to understand the initiative that we undertook at UMUC, it's helpful just briefly to understand a bit about our system, um, our university. So um, briefly, I promise, but you know, UMUC is one of the largest public universities in the US and we have over 80,000 students. Um, a bit over half of those students are affiliated in some manner with the US military. We are the open access adult serving public institution of the state of Maryland and we are a member of the 12 institution system of the University System of Maryland. We teach online, hybrid and face-to-face -face courses at over 140 sites, many of which are military installations in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, our students are adult learners with an average age of 33. 80% of them are working full time, 50% belong to a minority, and 50% are parents. So, you know, even before we started thinking about open educational resources, we have a long history of trying to control students' educational costs. We have the second lowest tuition rates in our state system. It's something we're very proud of. And we had already done sort of everything we could to rein in textbook costs um, to the extent that we were able, but you know, we really felt like it wasn't enough. You know, like students nationally and at all universities, students are on tight budgets, and so a not insignificant number of our students were foregoing um, textbook purchases. And also, given our active duty students spread around the globe, our textbooks didn't already arrive to the far-flung base in time for class. So starting in 2014, um, and really running to the end of 2016, uh, we undertook the revision of over 1,100 undergraduate and graduate courses wherein we replaced textbooks with um, open educational resources. And as a result of this, um, in, in 2017, and we have, would have a similar amount for 2018, um, our students did not have to spend $19 million um, that they otherwise would have had to spend previously. And you know, all this plus they now had access to learning resources with a click of a mouse. Uh, so, in a nutshell, that's what we did. Thank you so much. So, a lot of questions that people have about these initiatives uh, that are large scale and are OER revolve around the idea of sustainability. And I think a lot of those questions come because people wonder um, how will this continue in the future if there isn't continued um, funding for it? So, it, like in the case of SUNY and CUNY, they, they got some um, funding from their state, and there's a lot of other support from funders nationally. And folks are always wondering, once you start this, how can you make it last, both with institutional culture, um, with continued funding, and just the momentum, um, because leaders leaders come and go and there's also um, it takes a lot of effort on the part of the leaders and so if you could talk a little bit about sustainability um it, it, so uh this is mark i'll, I'll kind of talk about sustainability because you know one thing we realize is that you know oer are free like puppies um you know somebody has to pay something somewhere um, and it it takes a lot to sustain an OER initiative. I mean, we received money from the state, and if we didn't have that money, we wouldn't be able to grow the SUNY OER services like we've had in the last year. We, we know that. Um, but one thing we're doing um, to kind of prepare ourselves for a time when the state uh, won't, won't be funding our OER efforts 
Uh, we've contracted with an organization called the RPK Group. RPKs worked with the Achieving the Dream uh, OER uh, degree grant program. Um, and so, you know, they've looked at the return on investment of OER, and they also looked at the impact of, of OER um, actually on college bookstores. Um, so we engaged them and said, could you work with our campuses to help them design sustainability models? And, and this year we put an application process out on the streets for campuses to, to seek funds for OER uh, locally on their own campus. And one of the requirements this year is to actually stand up a sustainability program of their own, or at least adopt one and be prepared to implement once the state dollars run out. Because, you know, when we think about sustainability, we know it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost money. But one of the things we've learned is it, it requires an organization on the campus to essentially take ownership of it, to take responsibility for the program. Um, and so, you know, we made an agreement with RPK that once this work is done, the sustainability plans are, are, are you know, completed, the tools are, are, are implemented. We're going to openly license those uh, sustainability models and we're going to share them out broadly with the open community uh, because, you know, we know this is a moment in time for us. Um, and as a system, we want to be able to share what we learn uh, because, you know, we're standing here today, you know, learn, having learned a lot from California and Georgia uh, and Colorado and, and other state systems um, who have tried and, and, and successfully implemented OER programs of their own. Um, you know, when we first received word that we were getting money from the state, uh, you know, we hopped on the phone right away and we called about seven or eight different uh, state systems and we asked them to kind of you know, give us their advice because we were walking into a terrain um, that we were not 100% sure how to uh, to kind of navigate. So we didn't want to screw it up, so, so to speak. So we wanted to talk to other experts in the field who have better success or, or, or different, um, you know, uh, strategies than we have used in the past to see what we can learn. And, and we want to return the favor to the open community. Thank you. That's such an important um, thing to mention is that there are people in the open community who are willing to share their best practice, point you to the right people, and help you on your way. So that, that was a great um, share about your sustainability plan. Uh, Tina, do you have anything to add to that about CCC Online? So we got some initial support um, through a few innovation grants from the system office. Um, one for developing courses in the liberal arts, another one for an area of science, and then one for um, CCC Online plus two colleges, Red Rocks and CCD, Colorado uh, Community College of Denver, for an open homework platform. So we got some seed money that which helped. CCC Online also has um, a course uh, development budget from which we could draw in order to, um, as we revise courses, to really intentionally select those that would make good um, courses to be offered as online as, as OER. Um, we've primarily focused on our uh, high enrollment courses um, and general education courses. Um, also, we had um, some strategic. Um, it was part of the system strategic plan to establish a learning object repository, which CCC Online is taking the lead on. And with that, knowing that um, as we curate open content, knowing that we're going to have a way once we curate the open content, and, and tag it and align it to the common course numbering system that we'd be able to get traction for the materials that we're curating and we'd be able to put those those materials into the hands of the faculty and, and staff at the colleges. So those are some of the systemic things at the state level. Um, we also, and, and Tanya, you were, were part of this process, uh, writing, doing some of the research, but the state of Colorado um, legislature just passed a bill, Senate Bill 17258, which created an OER council. Um, and the OER council met and came up with um, some initial plans that informed the, the bill, which is now law. And we just kicked off the OER council for our 
our work moving forward. And what that's going to look like is primarily grants to institutions and faculty so that they can um, do more in the OER space, doing professional development um, for public institutions and, and faculty and staff in this area, looking at some policy. Um, so it's really going to, I think, help promulgate um, OER statewide, which I think will help not only sustain it for CCC online, but help some of the colleges um, and even K through 12 in the state. So we're pretty excited about that. And I think that that's going to really bear some fruit in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So, so far I hear some ideas about getting uh, input from out external stakeholders, creating councils or groups of experts within organizations. And then also you both mentioned the ideas of empowering the folks that you work with on your team. Um, Carol, what can you add to this for your experience at UMUC? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I would echo a lot of what Tina and Mark have said. Um, but, you know, I think in, turn of, in terms of financial sustainability, you know, one of the things that I, I have to definitely give a shout out to um, our institutional leadership. I mean, they, they had open eyes at the beginning and knew that this wasn't going to be free. You know, uh, no cost to students never means no cost to the institution, really. Um, and so we were really blessed um, by having good financial support from our institutional leadership. And of course, we've also pursued uh, grants and, and other sources of funding. Um, but I think that, you know, we one of the things is just in terms of sustainability, you know, we really are, are much more deeply aware than I think we were in the first pass that this work never stops, um, that, you know, resources have to continue to be created and curated and adapted and revised, and it just, it, it never stops. Um, and so one of the things that has become clear, I think, for us over the last four years is you know when you're when you're on that train that that you have to realize there is no end to the track you know really what is the institutional commitment and i think what has become clear is that we are committed to the approach um, and we know that attending to this task is really central uh, to the ongoing academic quality of our programs and i think that 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 institutional commitment has helped us sustain our momentum we also are you know trying to help um, you know our sister institutions across the state who are also looking at ways to, um, you know, it not only improve the quality of education, but really be mindful of the quality of cost of education and, and helping them also bring, you know, OERs uh, to, to their institutions and to benefit their students. One thing that's great about the OER community is that they love to share. And so I hear from all of you that you're working not only with the people within your institution and states, but also with the OER community as a whole. And um, there's this common thread among all three of the things that you said about sustainability. Um, one of the big ones that Kara was talking about was commitment, which is key but also this community, both external and internal, that you're all building this infrastructure together. So thank you for sharing that. We're gonna move on to the next question. So we talked about cost savings, and I, I know all three of you mentioned um, dollar amounts that are saving students. Can you talk more about the overall impact that this has had on the students and or faculty or just your your learning communities as a whole? And maybe this time we can start with Tina. So I, I, I shared our our cost um, savings to the to the students. Um, one of the things that and, and what we found is there's there in terms of student outcomes we're still in the process of examining those and we find that there's really no significant difference pre oer post oer offering um, one of the things though that in terms of our um, our teaching faculty and our the instructors who teach for us is one of the things that we've learned is the importance of uh, preparation for um, not only the course developers, but because what we're doing generally is 
we do use some like OpenStax, et cetera, textbooks, um, open textbooks, but most of our courses are designed in a way that we take away our content that we curate and then create a, a new course out of those learning objects. Um, and then the um, course developer then has to create a consistent narrative from that. Um, and it moves students away from um, a textbook type of um, learning experience. Instead, they're having to really use the learning management system and the resources. So one of the things that we found is we are really needing to do some, some development and training with the instructors and setting expectations with our students that this may not be designed like a course that you've had experience with before. Click on the links because the links that are there are considered content. They're not just supplemental. And working with the faculty and working with the instructors so that they're able to see, you know, really drive your students into the content. Check and make sure that they're really looking at the course content because what they're seeing in D2L in their course shell um, is fundamental and, and essential information. And I think that was a key take away just the way that students use curated OER content when we create a course is different than they do with a textbook so we really have to scaffold for that okay how about Tina can you share overall and I mean sorry Kara can you share your overall impact for students or something more than just the textbook cost savings yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what I would say is emotionally, this was a huge change. And I think it also made us aware, um, once again, uh, that change is really hard, um, that it's, you know, you're really fundamentally changing how people sort of go about um, what they're doing. Um, and, you know, also, as, is, as with any large scale initiative, you know, there are places, in this case, courses um, or resources where, you know, there's there's better, um, and then there's places where it's like, oh, we could have done better, right? So I think grappling with that, and we continue to work to make sure, you know, all the courses have great and rich resources, but now that, you know, we're four years out from the initial implementation and a lot of the dust has settled, you know, what I would say is that students are happy with this. Um, they, you know, they appreciate that the resources are online, they feel supported in their learning, um, and they, of course, appreciate the money that stays in their wallet. And importantly, we've also made sure that this didn't have any, you know, um, negative impacts on learning. So uh, that's also important as well, that they, that they are not only feeling supported in their learning, but actually are learning. Um, I do think it was a harder adjustment in general for faculty. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the things that has been really beneficial is our faculty have really helped us tremendously. Um, as we seek to iterate and improve, you know, they they let us know, you know, where where things are working well um, and where things aren't. Um, and I think also, again, now that we're sort of four years from the start of this, um, that that overall people are are feeling like the the impact was really positive, net positive. That's great. So you've got you've had a long time to really see this through and see some positive impact for your students. But I appreciate your honesty um, in discussing that it wasn't always easy and that it, you still are working toward um, even more goals. Um, Mark, can you talk a little bit about how you've seen impact from your OER initiative? Yeah, I mean, I kind of echoing what, what Kara said, I mean, we, we know that, you know, anytime you try to scale an innovation, whether it's OER or something else, you really, you need to develop a plan for change management. And, you know, we're, that's something that we're working on uh, with the SUNY OER services, because not only is it like a uh, a change in the, in, in, on the campus level, but we've also noticed that it's a change in the way the system is approaching uh, you know, just course content moving into the future. There's there's a lot of people in our system offices now who have a better understanding of what OER is and what the advantages are and kind of like piggybacking off a little what Tina said, we understand OER is really a vehicle to kind of change what's happening inside the classroom, moving away from the traditional idea of, of a college textbook 
and really thinking in terms of what can we do with digital learning um, moving into the future. You know, can we start? I mean, there are platforms already with like virtual re, uh, with uh, augmented uh, reality and virtual reality, but can we start baking in some artificial intelligence? Can you know? Can we start putting other technologies with the OVR and then? you know, wrap around that some sort of a research agenda so we can actually look at the effectiveness of the open content um, in the classroom. So one of the things we seed funded last year was the creation of the Open Education Research Lab. It's out of the University of Buffalo. You know, they're looking at, at OER, but they're also looking in research uh, with open access and open badges. I mean, they're looking at open education in, in, in the broadest context. Um, but I mean, what we've realized is that if you're going to, um, you know, try to scale up any type of innovation, you should wrap around it research, um, some sort of change management um philosophy or some sort of change management plan so that you know campuses eventually can can understand that you know adopting an oer program is more than just taking a tool or 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 technology and, and bringing it into your campus culture it's an opportunity to kind of transform your current culture uh, and it's an opportunity to really change uh you know how we deliver our course uh content um and i think tina mentioned before about you know really using the learning management system as a vehicle to deliver the content um you know we're all we're on board with that idea too you know we we think it's kind of a missed opportunity if we just um uh focus on the affordability uh piece with oer we know it saves students money that's excellent when it saves students money, especially when some of our students are, you know, are homeless uh, and can't afford, um, you know, three meals a day, uh, can't afford to pay their utility bills. Um, but, you know, on top of saving students money, we want to make sure that they're prepared uh, to be successful in their courses when they take it. So we think it's it's not binary. Uh, we think that it's it's it, it's an opportunity to kind of you know, wrap around um, a lot of different um, initiatives, like through our student success networks, uh, um, you know, that just kind of utilize OER as a, um, as maybe a vehicle within the change, and then eventually just weave it into the fabric of what we do within SUNY writ large. Awesome. So I'm hearing a lot of great questions on there and we'll get to those as we get to the um, end of this chat. Here's one of the big questions that everybody wants to know when they're starting an OER initiative or any change management is initiative. For the people who have already gone through this, if you knew then what you know now, what would you do differently? So how would you approach this? Um, what takeaways do you have and what can you share that's kind of a secret to the rest of us who are interested in starting our own OER initiative? And this time, let's start with Kara. Great. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. I have an answer for this one. Um, I have two words, taxonomy and database. So, you know, our initial stage of our initiative how we approached this is we basically said, okay, we're replacing the textbook. So we went into each course and we figured out the list of topics that needed to be covered and then found resources or created resources or adapted a set of resources for those topics. But the problem was that ultimately siloed all of these resources in individual courses and thus we didn't have a clear visibility um, across the entire inventory of resources. And we didn't have clear tagging, right? So we had a ton of materials, but we really had no way to know easily what we had and where it was. And so just to give, you know, a sampling of this, you know, in one subsequent audit of materials in a particular program, you know, that, that was sort of seeking to address this, to try to get, you know, a grip on what we had, um, we found that we had created, adapted, or adopted over a dozen resources on the same topic, right? Um, that's a lot of work to do what only needed to be done once, 12 times. Um, so I think that was one of the key takeaways from us is that 
you know, had had we known now, if, if we knew then what we know now, um, we would have started off with clear tagging, with a clear taxonomy, you know, with one place to to manage, you know, all of these resources and really have the library of the, re the resources. Um, because, you know, we recognize now that, you know, resources can be reused, they can be repurposed in different contexts, they can have very different, um, you know, uh, in, in different, you know, in different uh, contexts, um, they can serve different purposes. Um, and so we are moving towards achieving this. Um, and we believe it will be a game changer for how we discover, design, share, and continually improve the resources. But gosh, it's a lot of work to redo, right? So that's the big thing. I would say, you know, make sure you know um, as you are building it, you know, pretend that you really are building a library, you know, have a system by which you are really capturing what you have and where it is so that you can repurpose, reuse, and just, and, and not stumble into the, oh, darn, we just, you know, rewrote something because we forgot we already had it. Excellent. That's great advice to talk about metadata and tagging because that's one of the hot issues right now in the OER community. Um, Mark, what would you suggest for people if you could start off? Um, yeah, I mean, if we were going to do it again, I'm, we were fortunate, I think, that our libraries, um, you know, for the most part, really understood it at first and got into the OER game relatively early. Um, but kind of at a, uh, you know, Kara's point into what you were talking about, Tanya, you know, there, we should have probably started, uh, you know, building better connections across higher ed with other public university systems early on to kind of tackle the metadata. Um, I'll call it the problem um, because I think, you know, like English professors weren't invited to the email party. I think librarians weren't invited to the OER party early enough. Um, you know, we should we we should work as a collective to to uh, you know to just settle on the the metadata standard for OER uh, and begin kind of cleaning up the digital footprint. I think that'll help us with our discovery. Um, I think the other thing is, and you know, it's Kara's on the call right now. We have conversations with MJ Bishop um, at the Kerwin system all the time down in Maryland about you know building a coalition within public higher education systems because we're all you know we're all trying to approach this um differently but you know by the most for the most part i mean listening to kara and tina talk today we're really all kind of in the same boat sailing in the same direction right now and we should really work together so that public higher education is driving the open education agenda and that somebody else isn't driving that agenda to us I think it would be easy for us to lose sight of what we could do with open educational resources and open education writ large if we if we break into small silos and just focus these as individual state initiatives or individual uh, system or even college initiatives. You know, this is a global issue. Um, and if we could just get the university systems within the United States to agree to to coordinate better together. I think we could make a, a, a big dent and be the ones who drive the open education conference, uh, conversation moving forward. My biggest concern and my biggest fear is that eventually this conversation will be driven to us and we'll just eventually have to react again. You hear me cheering over here, right? <laughs> this is Tanya. Tina, what can you add to this discussion? Um, I'll give uh, uh, Mark a big amen to that. First off, um, that's exactly um, to the point. Our takeaway was that you know we should have engaged the broader community, uh, OER community earlier. I think some of our um, assumptions could have been challenged had we been, um, you know, had we reached out to those who've gone before us. Um, also, some of the things that we do differently, and I was um, interested to hear Kara and Mark talk about this, the notion of change management, um, because I think as we um, look at the scope of work required in developing OER courses to be offered at scale, um, you know, we should have taken the time to really look at 
our contracting processes, how we, our course developments, timelines, and, and really taking a step back and look at our current practices. Do these really um, support OER? Do they support the kind of time required by our, our course developers? And particularly the notion of change management in terms of maintaining the currency, the quality, the tagging, keeping up with the dynamic nature of the common course numbering system. Um, so those kinds of things, had we had, if we could do it over, I think we'd be a little bit more um, um, strategic and take a more project management approach to our initiative. Thank you so much to all three of you. You've mentioned things that were just so honest and right on um, about where OER is currently in the in the atmosphere. So. There are some questions that we have here from the audience. Uh, one of the questions that I think is very timely revolves around the question of um, research and um, understanding how this has an impact on your students. There were a few questions that asked um, what impact has this had on your students uh, with their grades and with their success? Um, if anybody wants to speak to the student success question and impact regarding OER. And then there was another question about how you calculate your total cost savings for OER. Um, yeah. And I know that in the last few weeks we had quest we had some blog posts and challenges um, with some articles online. And, and so I think that everybody's kind of curious right now about how people are, are calculating their cost savings. So if anybody wants to talk about um, either cost savings for students or student success measures. Well, I... This, this is, is Kara. Uh, go for it, Kara. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'll just tell you the math behind our cost savings because this is something that um, I know different institutions have done that. There's a few different ways to do it, so I'll just explain our math. Um, we literally went back and we looked at every single course, and we looked at what the materials textbook costs were for students in that course before the initiative. Um, and then we added all that up. And so that was how we came to our cost. It was literally, um, and we're not really saying it's, you know, cost savings, it's the money that they don't have to spend now that they would have had to spend if we hadn't done this. And that's how um, we came up with the $19 million a year. And that was also specific to number of students. So, you know, um, it literally looked at the cost per course, how many students took that course, um, and that's how we did the math. Uh, yeah, this is Mark. I mean, our, our math is somewhat similar to that. We we uh, for the for our initiative last year, we actually had faculty tell us what the cost was for previous semesters, and we just went with the assumption that every student bought the textbook. Um, what was interesting is that it it got many of our faculty to actually figure out how much the students were actually spending on textbooks. So I guess uh, there was a little uh, cloak and dagger move there, um, but you know. It, it it helped us kind of get a, at least a baseline idea as far as the student success this is this is um i mean to me this is a this is the 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 million dollar question right there is a lot of claims about oer um but you know some of the research that's been done so far i mean it's 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 a good start but um i mean there needs to be more empirical research more uh research uh, done by educational, uh, you know, scientists and learning scientists to really look at the impact OER is having on student learning. I mean, anecdotally, we can say that it's had a positive effect. Uh, the Open Education Research Lab just published an article on student uh, and faculty perceptions of OER. Uh, it showed that students and faculty alike both uh, thought OER um, had better academic value. Uh, than traditional content. It was either equal or better nearly uh, every time in, in the student survey. Uh, but there needs to be more analysis and, and further understanding of the, the total impact it's having on students. Because, and you know, that takes time. I mean, you, you can't just have an OER course run for a semester or two, run a data analysis, and then turn around and make a claim. I mean, it takes, it takes a while 
um, to to be able to stand back and say this is the impact that it's really having and you know, having on, on on student learning. You're going to need about three years of data so that you can actually write um, a, a decent you know research study on that. And before you even get to even analyzing data, you have to be asking the right research questions. Uh, and so this is another area where I think public higher education system should get together. Um, you know, we could amass a large data set. Uh, and if we can all agree on the basics of what we mean by open educational resources and what we're looking at for an open educational resource course, and we can all share some of that data with each other, uh, we could start running some research and we can run study after study after study with a similar theoretical framework and similar design. Uh, we could turn around within five years and, and start making some serious claims about the impact of OER in higher ed. I would add to that that the places that I would point folks to if you're looking for some really good research that has been done so far, um, if you would just go to the open ed. say as large of scale initiatives as the ones that Mark was talking about, like five year plans, but they have a lot of that I would point folks to, and this might be a great exemplar for something like Mark was saying about um, uh, states getting together, but it's the Georgia study. So the Georgia system just recently published their student impact study. Um, and I would look to that too as, you know, some preliminary research in this area. Um, Tina, do you have any more to add about either calculating cost savings or research that's been done uh, for student impact? So for the student impact, um, you know, it's it's really to to Mark's point, it's really too early to tell. Our preliminary look is that our DFW rates are stable pre and post, but I think it, that's just um, it's it's really premature to to make any of those claims. Um, in terms of calculating costs, we do it very similar to what Kara described. Um, because we use a lot of digital resources um, before going into OER, um, and those are digital resource fees, we know that textbook adoption um, from the students or students buying the textbook isn't a factor because we do more digital um, integrations. And so we literally took what was the cost of the e-textbook or the digital content pre and post OER, and multiply it by the number of students, the enrollment in that section, and then added it all up. Thank you so much, all three of you, for sharing your tips and um, thoughts for the future. We have so many questions on this call. I'm so excited to see all of your questions. A lot of them have to do with platforms, what kind of um, digital platforms are you using? Uh, have you worked with any vendors to to help you implement OER. Um, a lot of it is talking about how do you build your inventory? Uh, do you have um, pe other people that you work with? And so I'm seeing a lot of questions um, in a lot of different areas about the OER. There's just a lot of exciting interest. Uh, what I would say is that we will continue to um, talk about this on Twitter and with WCET's Z initiative. We also have upcoming um, an OER pre-conference session at our annual meeting. So there's a lot of opportunities to continue the discussion. Um, if we could go to possibly just one more question. Um, does anybody have any uh, advice regarding platforms or uh, has anybody worked with any vendors or any companies to, talk, to help them with their um, implementation. Um, so this is Mark. I mean, one of our, we have a partnership with Lumen Learning. Um, I mean, Lumen has been with us since, uh, you know, the Kaleidoscope project back in 2011, before there even was a Lumen Learning. They were working with Tompkins Cortland Community College. So a lot of our community colleges worked with Lumen for a number of years. Um, and then 
you know, just as we started to scale up at the SUNY OER services, we entered into an agreement with them and now we've entered into a partnership where we're looking at them as being um, kind of a foundational piece for our OER efforts. I mean, we're not exclusively just a Lumen shop. We, we, we work with a lot of different vendors, um, but in, in, in the hopes of driving the education conversation, you know, we're looking at Lumen as a development partner and you know we want to we kind of want to peek behind their curtain as they go through their development and then we want to have a seat at the table when they start thinking about what they want to develop next and you know we would again we still want public higher ed to drive this we don't want a particular vendor driving it to us Uh, this is Kara. I, I can comment. You know, we are working um, in in terms of, of content management. Um, we are now working with um, uh, Adobe Experience Manager, um, and that's helping us with a lot of you know not only content development but curation um, and and the like. Uh, this is Tina. We're not really working with any vendors in our OER initiative, but we did partner with. Cal State um, to white label the skills commons environment to serve as our learning object repository. So um, we hope to roll that out um, here shortly. Excellent, thank you. I think that helps a lot. Um, do you have any advice about where you would start um, either with um, organizations that are part of the open community or great resources for the folks that are on this call. I would just say there's a few that I always go to, including the Open Textbook Library at University of Minnesota, um, Spark website, which is a scholarly publishing and academic coalition. Um, Mark and, uh, talked about Lumen Learning, and that's run by David Wiley. Are there other places that you usually go or check? Um, Oh, I know another one for me is Twitter. <laughs> how, how many of you are really active on Twitter or get a lot of information from there? Oh, this is Mark. I'm more of a I, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say, I just, you know, the uh, Twitter just makes me twitch right now for other reasons unrelated to higher education. Um, but I have found the community um, at, at Open Education Global um, really valuable, and there's sort of too many to name, um, but just the global community in, in Open Education has been wonderful to really see how, uh, you know, people are tackling some of the same problems and some different problems. Um, so I find that, uh, you know, not only the conference, um, but other resources uh, coming out of that group to be very valuable. And, you know, the Open Education Conference will be in New York State this year, folks, in Niagara Falls, New York. So come on up to the Empire State and enjoy our apples and enjoy a good look at the falls. I'll be there. Oh, <laughs> I know Tanya will be there. She wouldn't miss it. I'm going to jump in. This is Megan. I just wanted to say thank you all for being part of this conversation. There are many, many more questions that we could have gotten to today. I think it says that we need to do other sessions, maybe at our annual meeting, other webcast presentations. And I think we have some questions here that could fodder a few of our WCET blogs. So. If you're new to WCET, if this is your first introduction to us, we have a wonderful website that has tons of resources. Be sure to get on and access our resources. Our annual meeting that Tanya mentioned up mentioned is coming up, and Tanya will be doing an OER workshop on the morning of October 23rd. The link to the recording as well as any resources that we can pull together that were mentioned in this webinar will be posted there as well, and you'll receive a link to the recording shortly after it's over. We are so appreciative of our supporting members here at WCET and our sponsors that underwrite much of our programming and events. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them. And thank you again. Thanks for your great questions. Thanks for your participation. And for those of you that were on early, thanks for persevering with those audio challenges. And we'll see you on the next WCET webcast. Thanks so much, enjoy your day.
ਜੀ